Hello, and welcome to the latest installment of Reading the Victorian Novel, Charles Dickens's Great Expectations. I'm Dr. Christian Lehman, and today we will be talking about chapters 32 to 39, which brings us up to the end of the first, the second volume. So in this chapter, um, in chapters 32, when London, we have the famous visit to Newgate, and 33, Estella comes to London and goes to Richmond. Chapter 34, we're in London. Herbert and Pip look into their affairs. They're both deeply in debt. And then chapter 35, we go back to Pip's village for the funeral of his sister. In chapter 36, we have a short time jump. We're in London. Pip is now 21 years old, and he comes of age and comes into his inheritance. 37, we go out to Wemmick and Walworth. 38, we're in Satis house back at the village for Miss Habisham. And in 39, we age Pip up again to now being 23 years old, and we are at the Temple Bar, and the convict returns. So let's look at some passages. Here we have Wemmick the gardener. This is on the way to Newgate, and then in Newgate. It struck me that Wemmick walked among the prisoners much as a gardener might walk among his plants. This was first put into my head by his seeing a shoot that had come up in the night. So here we have Pip's imagination, um, seeing Wemmick as somebody um, who works with nature, but he's talking about prisoners. So it's a way of kind of simultaneously dehumanizing the prisoners and romanticizing the work that Wemmick does. Um, and it's also just like a peculiarity. Uh, it kind of protects Pip from seeing these people as people because he has a problem with the, just even the idea of convicts and prisoners. But this is not the first time we've seen Wemmick as a gardener. For earlier, back um, in chapter 25, when we first met him or went to Walworth, we read, at the back, there's a pig and there are fowls and rabbits. Then I knock together my own little frame that you see and grow cucumbers. And you'll judge at supper what sort of salad I can raise. I am my own engineer, my own carpenter, my own plumber, and my own gardener, and my own jack of all trades, said Wemmick in acknowledging my compliments. So there's something here, I think, that is maybe with the, um, the prison situation at Newgate, unfair to Wemmick because Wemmick tries so hard to maintain a strict separation between work and Walworth. And then Pip, with his metaphor, is collapsing those two. All of this uh, leads to this kind of substantial paragraph that I have here. Notice um, I have hand capitalized in gold um, and it begins the passage. And so we have a framing mechanism there that allows us to really concentrate in this. And as I read it, I want you to pay attention to the language of the taint and corruption. With some three hours on hand, I consumed the whole time in thinking how strange it was that I should be encompassed by all this taint of prison and crime, that in my childhood, out on our lonely marshes on a winter evening, I should have first encountered it, that it should have reappeared on two occasions, starting out like a stain that was faded but not gone that it should in this new way pervade my fortune and advancement. While my mind was thus engaged, I thought of the beautiful young Estella, proud and refined, coming towards me, and I thought with absolute abhorrence of the contrast between the jail and her. I wished that Wemmick had not met me, or that I had not yielded to him and gone with him, so that of all days in the year on this day, I might not have had Newgate in my breath and on my clothes. I beat the prison dust off my feet as I sauntered to and fro, and I shook it out of my dress, and I exhaled its air from my lungs. So contaminated did I feel, remembering who was coming, that the coach came quickly after all, when I was not yet free from the soiling consciousness of Mr. Wemmick's conservatory, when I saw her face at the coach window and her hand waving to me. So here what we have is Pip develops this metaphor of the prison by being there actually corrupting him and tainting him and um, making him feel soiled and dirty. And then we use this technique called anaphora, which is the repetition of a word or phrase at the start of successive clauses. Um, in this case, it's that, and it introduces these ideas as he tracks his history of proximity to convicts. And so he says, the first encountering it was on the marshes. That was the first encounter with the convict. Then the two other occasions, one is when the man comes and stirs the cup at the 
three jolly bargemen with the file, and he gives the one pound notes to Pip. And the other was on the stagecoach with the prisoners that they came down. And then this new way is the visit, the tourism of the prison. Um, so prison tourism, which is kind of what Pip is doing, was a thing in the 19th century when Dickens was in America, for instance. He went to the Eastern Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, where they specialized in solitary confinement, and he uh, vituperated against it, thinking it was the kind of epitome of inhumanity. And at the end of this, what he does is he tries to beat it out. And so what it's presented as is a contamination that gets in the lungs. And this is almost um, a theory of disease called the miasma theory, which is this idea that just like the air was full of disease and then got on you. So in the very famous cholera epidemic, before it was figured out that it was all coming from a bad pipe um, that had been um, contaminated itself and people were getting it through the water, one of the leading theories was this miasma theory that it kind of was just like in the air and around. Uh, so that's part of that idea of exhaling it from the lungs. The passage, though, that I'm really interested in that we're going to keep following is the abhorrence of the contrast between the jail and her. First, a little bit more on this um, infection. So earlier, right, much earlier with Estella, Pip had already had this idea. So back in page 60, chapter 8, I had never thought of being ashamed of my hands before, but I began to consider them a very indifferent pair. Her contempt was so strong that it became infectious, and I caught it. So Pip is very passive in certain ways, right? His body is vulnerable to the quote-unquote diseases around him, but the diseases are not actual sickness. Instead, here, he was infected with class consciousness and class anxiety, and now at the prison, he's contaminated with the idea that he might be have opened himself up to prison somehow. Then with the idea of the abhorrence, it recalls a moment in chapter 15, Quote, I was haunted by the fear that she would sooner or later find me out with a black face and hands doing the coarsest work of my part of my work and would exult over me and despise me. So there, right, this idea when he was a laborer, he was afraid that Estella was going to see him. And now he thinks his propinquity to crime is something that Estella is going to see and judge. So moments from the past that are still present and haunting him kind of tells us that as a person, he has not changed too much, even though he's come into this fortune. When Estella shows up, she's quite forceful in her idea that both she and Pip are puppets. This is my purse, and you are to pay my charges out of it. Oh, you must take the purse. We have no choice, you and I, but to obey our instructions. We are not free to follow our own devices, you and I. So I'm really interested in the pronouns here because simultaneously, Estella yokes her and Pip together. We, our, we, our, and separates them. You and I, you and I, you do this thing, I do this thing, but you're holding my purse, paying for it out of there. And clearly Pip had been like, oh no, I can cover it. And she has to say, oh, you must take the purse. Right. She wants that to be very clear, like this is transactional, but she's paying her own way. But she's also letting Pip be a part of it. So it's this kind of back and forth, like drawing him in, us pushing him away, you and I. Later, her reverting to this tone as if our association were forced on us and we were mere puppets gave me pain. Um, so here is his kind of interpretation of this moment, right? Havisham is in the background, moving them along, and they have to do the action that's accorded to them. And then finally, it is part of Miss Havisham's plans for me, Pip, said Estella with a sigh as if she were tired. I am to write to her constantly and see her regularly and report how I go on. I am the jewels, for they are nearly all mine now. So here, right, how I go on, I and the jewels, she's separating herself into being just a carrier of the jewels. Like the jewels almost have more existence than she does. She's seen, sees herself as just an object in the way that jewels are objects. In chapter 34, it's a very funny chapter 
um, where Pip and Herbert look into their affairs and leave a margin. So it's like, oh, we're super broke, but let's say we're more broke than we are. That way it feels like we have a little bit of money and thus they get farther down. Um, at the end of this, though, we have a very interesting, or in the middle of it, phrase from Herbert. When we gradually fell into keeping late hours and late company, I noticed that he looked about him with a desponding eye at breakfast time, that he began to look about him more hopefully about midday, that he drooped when he came into dinner, that he seemed to descry capital in the distance rather clearly after dinner, that he all but realized capital towards midnight, and that at about two o'clock in the morning, he became so deeply despondent again as to talk of buying a rifle and going to America with a general purpose of compelling buffaloes to make his fortune. So you'll remember that when Pip first met Herbert, Herbert had this idea that he was going to go into trade. East Indies, West Indies. I talked about him being a child of empire. Now we see another kind of trope of the 19th century, which is the idea of America as an empty location where a fortune can be made. So I want to turn to two scholars and then offer my own opinion about what's happening here. So David Parisian in his companion says about this um, idea, the American buffalo, this is after 1825, or bison, was hunted ruthlessly and to near extinction by the mid-century. Their wholesale slaughter by Europeans occurred because buffalo tongues were prized as a delicacy. They were also shot for sport from trains on the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad at Promontory Point, Utah. So what is being left out here is a number of the reasons for the uh, slaughter of the buffalo. Um, one, they're high, it was all surprised. But the main reason, the leading cause of this was to get rid of a food source and an economic source for the indigenous peoples of North America, right? The white soldiers killed all of the buffalo in order to decimate the indigenous population. So in both of these passages, in the Dickens, in the Parisian, we have indigenous erasure that's occurring, right? So if we look back here at this page, um, Herbert only pictures like the Wild West with um, kind of a manifest destiny approach, go West, he's going to kill these buffalo, they're going to bring him this thing, it's going to be easy. I mean, he's a white man, he's a British white man, no problem to go into another land and just gain economic fortune. Uh, Brian Cheadle briefly does bring this up. He first talks about how comic the scene is, and then he says here, the middle class fantasy of achieving wealth without real work depends upon displacing the actual making of the fortune onto the buffalo, parenthesis, a structure of thought which could equally accommodate slaves or natives, close parenthesis. Exploitation is disguised as a test of manhood, and the violence of the envisaged compelling is naturalized by the humor and by the convenient assumption that the periphery is empty of all but natural resources. All right. So here in that parenthesis, we have um, the mention of an indigenous population, but even Cheeto ignores the kind of violence of the statement um, that essentially Herbert is saying he's going to join this force of people that are eradicating the original population of North America. But he's doing it out of complete ignorance, right? I'm not trying to say he, this is his, his goal, but it's that passivity, that not questioning why you do things that's there. Um, so this is a little bit about the debt. Um, we spent as much money as we could and got as little for it as people could make up their minds to give us. We were always more or less miserable, and most of our acquaintance were in the same condition. There was a gay fiction among us that we were constantly enjoying ourselves, and a skeleton truth that we never did. Um, so what I'm interested in here is the kind of connection between fiction and death. Um, and so this gay fiction, this like joyous, kind of uh, overjoyed fantasy that they're having a good time is juxtaposed to the skeleton truth, right? The death of that is the truth that is um, empty of flesh on the outside of it, that they are not enjoying themselves, right? Um, and this is a small sentence that also tells us how the larger part of the chapter works because it starts with this high humor about the fiction of the debts, et cetera, and it ends with the announcement of the death of Mrs. Joe, of Pip's sister, who again has yet to be named. And this in turn perhaps 
reflects the entire novel that's going on, right? Pip is the older retrospective narrator looking back, telling us this tale, um, trying to show us the truth as much as he can, while also ensuring that like, parts of it are fictionalized. So it's a really interesting sentence there, the gay fiction and skeleton truth that helps us think through some of the ways in which this novel functions um, at a structural and imaginative level. Death of Mrs. Joe. The envelope has a quote, heavy black seal and border. The letter was signed Trab and Co. And its contents were simply that I was an honored sir and that they begged to inform me that Mrs. J. Gargery had departed this life on Monday last. So I'm simply showing this um, with images from the Victorian web, uh, photographed by Michael Marks of a Victorian morning card, right? It's wrapped, it's um, framed in black. That way the recipient knows either that it contains a letter about this or if it's from you, that you're in mourning and maybe that will affect how somebody responds. So it's a, it's a cool insight into the Victorian period of one of the tropes around death. There's a lot of theater around death in the 19th century. And in fact, all of chapter 35 is essentially a pastiche, a really brutal satire on this practice. Um, I'm not gonna be looking at it, but that's what's going on there. Instead, I wanna talk a little bit about Pip and Biddy. This is after the funeral, because there's no more Mrs. Joe to take care of, it's not appropriate for Biddy to stay in the house. How are you going to live, Biddy? If you want any money, how am I going to live? Repeated Biddy, striking in with a momentary flush upon her face. I'll tell you, Mr. Pip, I am going to try to get the place of mistress in the new school nearly finished here. I can be well recommended by all the neighbors, and I hope I can be industrious and patient and teach myself while I teach others. You know, Mr. Pip pursued Biddy with a smile as she raised her face to her eyes to my face. The new schools are not like the old, but I learned a good deal from you after that time and have had time since then to improve. So what I really like here is like Pip doesn't even have his own source of money. Like he doesn't work to get this money and he's sitting there offering it to Biddy. Biddy is proud and immediately says, no, I have ways to make money. Not only have I been an employee of taking care of Mrs. J, I'm also educated. There's a new school coming. It needs a schoolmistress. I can probably get that job and the people will recommend me, right? She is a part of a community in a way that Pip has completely ostracized himself from it. And I like these two hints of kind of anger striking in, momentary flush. And then as she talks, she says she can be patient and she in fact is in acting a huge amount of patience with Pip. Here's Mrs. Joe's last words. Um, and what I'm interested in here is some punctuation. Uh, Biddy is telling Pip about the last hours. They are very slight, poor thing. She'd been in one of her bad states, though they had gotten better of late, rather than worse. For four days, when she came out of it in the evening, just at tea time, and said quite plainly, Joe, as she had never said any word for a long while, I ran and fetched in Mr. Gargery from the forge. And so she presently said, Joe, again, and once, pardon, and once, pip. And so she never lifted her head up anymore. And it was just an hour later when we laid it down on her own bed because we found she was gone. So what I'm interested in here is the different ways of reading the Joe pardon so it could be three unrelated words. It could be asking us to pardon somebody else, but it reads two ways. You could have it read, to Joe, I need you to pardon Pip himself, right? So Joe, forgive Pip. Another way it could be read though is Joe, pardon Joe, and then addressing Pip, Pip, pardon Joe. Um, and then it could just be Joe, I need you here, um, and then maybe the world, pardon Pip, the reader, pardon Pip, Biddy, pardon Pip. Um, and it's one of these things, right? Maybe a lot of some behavior that we might see from Joe is going to come from this moment, this injunction about pardoning Pip, even in all of his pride. Uh, I'm not going to say much about here. Of, this is Pip turning 21, chapter 37. 
Herbert and I went on from bad to worse in the way of increasing our debts, looking into our affairs, leaving margins, and the exemplary transactions. And time went on, whether or no, as he has a way of doing. And I came of age in fulfillment of Herbert's prediction that I should do so before I knew where I was. Um, interesting capitals on margins and time, this thing that is like a man-made fiction versus a skeleton truth. Again, that theme that I was trying to talk about earlier. Coming of age simply means he turns 21 and he now gets a larger part of his, his inheritance and no longer has a guardian in the form of Jaggers. And so he's free to kind of do what he wants with his money and he doesn't know what he wants until he comes up with an idea, which we'll look at in a second. But first we have these presumptions. He's getting mad at Jaggers. He thinks Jaggers is treating him poorly. We looked at one another until I withdrew my eyes and looked thoughtfully at the floor. From this last speech, I derived the notion that Miss Havisham, for some reason or no reason, had not taken him into her confidence as to her designing me for Estella, that he resented this and felt a jealousy about it, or that he really did object to that scheme and would have nothing to do with it. This, of course, you know, is a complete fantasy on Pip's part. There's never been any indication that this is a fact. He simply started telling it to himself one day and then kept telling himself it and then looked around at various things that he thought were evidence of it. So that's why we had back here um, this idea of the, the plan. And he hears things about this and he just it thinks that he's included. And we're getting this quite strong one um, right here moments before, right? Three chapters before we're going to have the revelation of the convict. Pip the benefactor. So he wants to do something with his money. And here's what he comes up with. For all these reasons, I told Wemmick, and because he was my young companion and friend, I had a great affection for him. I wished my own good fortune to reflect some rays upon him. And therefore, I sought advice from Wemmick's experience and knowledge of men and affairs, how I could tr best try with my resources to help Herbert to some present income, say of a hundred a year, to keep him in good hope and heart, and gradually to buy him on to some small partnership. Um, so this is one of the good deeds, right? People like there's the good deeds that Pip does, even in his blindness and ignorance. What I'm interested in, though, is maybe a little bit of a twist on that good deed, which is Pip is trying to set himself up to be a benefactor. There's going to be terms to this. Um, there's the the false front that Clericker will be the one employing Herbert and not the other way around. So um, Herbert is going to kind of be a Pip in a certain way. Um, and Pip is going to be a Havisham? No, we now know a convict. This is one of my favorite scenes in the novel, so that's why I'm including it here. It's lightly comic, but it's also Pip seeing a healthy relationship. As Wemmick and Miss Skippen sat side by side, and as I sat in a shadowy corner, I observed a slow and gradual, gradual elongation of Mr. Wemmick's mouth powerfully suggested of his slowly and gradually stealing his arm around Miss Skiffins' waist. In the course of time, I saw his hand appear on the other side of Miss Skiffins. But at that moment, Miss Skiffins neatly stopped him with the green glove, unwound his arm again as if it were an article of dress, and with the greatest deliberation laid it on the table before him. Miss Skiffins' composure while she did this was one of the most remarkable sights I have ever seen. And if I could have thought the act consistent with abstraction of mind, I should have deemed that Miss Skiffins performed it mechanically. So, I know, Wemmick and Skiffins, right? This is a relationship of comfort, of familiarity, of, of flirtation. Um, and Pip is always on the outside. Pip thinks he's involved in this grand romance. And so he looks at them, at these people that he's kind of condescending to, and says, this level of engagement is mechanical. <clears throat> and I want us to pay attention to that word mechanical because it's kind of, we're going to see it reappear later on. Uh, to review a, a term, an oxymoron is when you have two ideas that are opposite next to each other, uh, and it's used for emphasis and to make us stop and think about a scene. She was even more dreadfully fond of Estella than she had been when I last saw them together. I repeat the word advisedly, for there was something positively dreadful in the energy of her looks and embraces. She hung upon Estella's beauty, hung upon her words, hung upon her gestures, and sat mumbling her own trembling fingers while she looked at her, as though she were devouring the beautiful creature she had reared. So dreadfully fond is the oxymoron, right? Fondness, a positive 
connotated word, dreadful, one full of like fear and anxiety, dread. And so those two things don't go next to each other. And so it's, it's, a, it's a form of fondness that is harmful. Then we have the triple repetition of hung. So in a novel that opened with a fear of hanging with the gibbet, um, it's interesting to pick this word at this moment. And also um, in that opening scene, the first time Pip goes to Saddest House, he has a fantasy of seeing uh, Miss Havisham hanging herself. And on the last part, this is that vampirism, devouring the beautiful creature she had reared, right? Cannibalism, vampirism, um, calling now Estella a creature she had reared. So we also have the devouring of what you make. And there is this sense kind of along the lines of those that puppeting earlier that Estella is a creation and now her creator is destroying her. In chapter 39, which is the chapter with the convict, Pip ages up again and he moves to Temple Inn. I was three and 20 years of age. Not another word had I heard to enlighten me on the subject of my expectations. And my 23rd birthday was a week gone. We had moved from, or we had left Barnard's Inn more than a year and lived in the temple. Our chambers were in Garden Court down by the river. So here's a nice map of legal London. This top square is Barnard's. You can see up on Holborn Hill. And then down here, this large facility is the temple. And here you can see it as well. And he says we had moved to the garden court down by the river. So he's in these apartments right here. Um, so over here on the other map. So as you can see, this is what he's doing with his money. He's moving closer to the river, which you can easily imagine. Better accommodations, less dilapidated, but a huge increase in rent. So we have kind of the prodigal, prodigality on his part um, that we see in those locations. There's a phenomenal passage at the start of this chapter. It was wretched weather, stormy and wet, stormy and wet, and mud, 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 deep in all the streets. Day after day, a vast, heavy veil had been driving over London from the east, and it drove still, as if in the east there were an eternity of cloud and wind. So furious had been the gusts that high buildings in town had had the lead stripped off their roofs, and in the country trees had been torn up and sails of windmills carried away, and gloomy accounts had come in from the coast of shipwreck and death. Violent blasts of rain had accompanied these rages of wind, and the day just closed, as I sat down to read, had been the worst of all. So, I'm into a lot of the things that are here. The atmosphere is incredible. Um, with all of the mud and rain, that what's being created is an urban marsh. And since is, is the chapter with the return of the convict, we are directly referencing some of that earlier language from the marshes when we first met the convict. But it's also reminiscent of Bower Lighton's Paul Clifford from 1830, with the very famous sentence, not the first use of the sentence, but by the one that made it commonplace, it was a dark and stormy night. The rain fell in torrents, except at occasional intervals, when it was checked by a violent gust of wind which swept up the streets. For it is London that our scene lies, rattling along the housetops and fiercely agitating the scanty flame of the lamps that struggled against the darkness. So uh, one of these wonderful tropes of what gets termed bad writing, uh, I'm really sympathetic for it, I think it's fantastic because it's not just Dark and Stormy Night. <laughs> Bower Lighton actually then develops the idea. And in the same way, Dickens starts here with it was wretched weather, stormy and wet, stormy and wet, right? A form of repetition and mirroring that some might view as redundant. But in fact, it helps show just how remorseless, how repetitive this has been. That triple repetition of mud, something that you should know is that mud is um, horse, uh, it's dung, right? It's feces, it's human, animal, um, vegetable matter that's rotting. So it is everything that can come um, out of somebody and that's on the street, right? Because if you remember, we, you know, we're not in an age of automobiles here. It's stagecoaches, which means horses. We talked earlier about Smithfields being this 
cattle market in the middle of town, right? How do you get those animals there? You drive them in and out. Blood pours out because it's also a slaughterhouse. So the streets are incredibly disgusting. Um, it's interesting. All right. So then, but we also have this texture of the shipwreck. So gloomy accounts had come in from the coast of shipwreck and death. At the moment of revelation that the convict is Pip's benefactor, all the truth of my position came flashing on me and its disappointments, dangers, disgraces, consequences of all side rushed in in such a multitude that I was borne down by them and had to struggle for every breath I drew. So Pip is setting up this shipping uh, shipwreck metaphor and then he himself is the ship. So the flashing on me is the lightning strike. The rushing in is the hole in the boat. I was borne down, right? Getting dragged under the water, had to struggle for every breath I drew, now drowning. So this movement um, over the course of a shipwreck that he himself is experiencing. A few pages later, I began fully to know how wrecked I was and how the ship in which I had sailed was gone to pieces. So it's really nice. I, I like the use of this early introduction of a shipwreck and then the tracking of it, sometimes subtly as in the borne down and struggling for breath, and then sometimes just blatantly, the ship I'm in is wrecked. A couple similarities that, you know, maybe we can recognize the convict earlier than Pip recognizes. Um, moving the lamp as the man moved, I made out that he was substantially dressed, but roughly like a voyager by sea, that he had long iron gray hair, that his age was about 60. Um, so we had just had that ship wrecked. Now we have the convict showing up dressed like a voyager at sea. So he's somebody that maybe Pip wished had not survived the sea voyage. Um, when we first found, met the convict, a fearful man all in coarse gray with a great iron on his leg. So that word iron, um, right, it's, it's flimsy. It's not a really strong connection, but nonetheless, it is one. Um, a man with no hat and with broken shoes and with an old rag tied around his head, a man who had been soaked in water and smothered in mud, right? So he went from being insubstantially dressed to now substantially dressed, being wet, to having kind of clothes made that protect him from the wet. Um, and then to connect it back to that um, wretched weather passage, here we have the soaked in water, the smothered in mud, right? He's living um, barely on the marshes, right, to survive. So we have a, that kind of repetitive language carry through. I'm not going to read this passage, but I simply want to show that Dickens goes out of his way to create a really dense network of re prefixed words repeated replied resented recognition respond recoil return relinquish recall reluctant recognition um because this is all stuff that has happened before so this is the kind of thing it's really hard to um lay out an argument for it it's a thing you have to feel it's part of the texture of the novel but if you look at the kind of preponderance of those re words you can start to make that argument that in this, we have a huge return of the past that is almost overwhelming Pip in and of its own. This is the convict declaring what he's done. And then my dear boy, it was a recompense to me, looky here, to know in secret that I was making a gentleman. The blood horses of them colonists might fling up the dust over me as I was walking, what do I say? I says to myself, I'm making a better gentleman or ever you'll be. When one of them says to another, hey, he was a convict a few years ago and is an ignorant common fella now. For all he's lucky, what do I say? I says to myself, if I ain't a gentleman nor yet ain't got no learning, I'm the owner of such. All on you own stock and land, which on you owns a brought up one gentleman. So here we have the convict, the creator. In the way that Miss Havisham is the creator of Estella, the convict has created Pip to be an enactor of his revenge against these colonists that look down on him. Notice he is crafting himself, right? It's like a God and Adam type moment. He's made him, but then he switches from that kind of like creation to ownership. I'm the owner of such. And remember, he was down in Australia. So this is mimicking some of that language of um, enslavement and harm to Aboriginal populations. This is also being read at the in the middle of the start of the Civil War, the American Civil War, which is a war fought on the idea of slavery. And so 
the different audiences are going to react to this differently. And it's really interesting, but really problematic, the language that he's using. This whole time, Pip has thought he's an independent agent. Um, he knows the plan of Havisham, and all of that is now gone. So here, I'm going to lay out some of this evidence, right? We talked about it earlier, um, but here, Magwood, this, uh, the convict, says, um, I'm making a better gentleman. The blood horses of the colonists might fling up the dust over me, and as I was walking, what do I say? I says, I'm making a better gentleman, nor ever you'll be, right? I'm making revenge against these people. Miss Havisham. While she looked at her as though she were devouring the beautiful creature she had reared, Estella was set to wreck Miss Havisham's revenge on men. So both cases, right, Pip now realizes how much he is like Estella. They are created to do these things. Miss Havisham had been jilted at the altar and so wanted revenge against all men. Um, Pip, uh, Megwitch has been looked down upon over in Australia by the colonists, and now, because he had been a, a forced laborer, and now he's going to enact revenge against them by making Pip a gentleman. And here is that um, recognition that he experiences. Miss Havisham's intentions towards me, all a mere dream. Estella not designed for me. I only suffered in Satta's house as a convenience, a sting for the greedy relations, a model with a mechanical heart to practice on when no other practice was at hand. Those were the first smarts I had, but sharpest and deepest pain of all. It was for the convict, guilty of I knew not what crimes and liable to be taken out of these rooms where I sat thinking and hanged at the old Bailey door that I had deserted Joe. The thing I'm most interested in here is to connect it to the earlier reference to mechanical behavior. He sees that he was viewed as a robot, right? He's this whole time has been thinking about himself as an agent. And now he's confronted with the idea that other people are seeing him as an object as a puppet, as this mechanically hearted being, a model for others to practice on. So that I think is what are the, the real cruelty that he's experienced and kind of against himself and his recognition, to use one of those re prefixed words of just how remote he is from the reality of any situation. And with that, I say farewell.